Hey everyone, Genome here. Uh, just want to give you kind of a uh, an introduction to what you're about to watch. Uh, this is going to cover my excursion to Kentucky to visit the Kentucky Reptile Zoo. Uh, this is the trip I've been wanting to make for a while, and. Uh, the directors of the facility, uh, Jim Harrison and Kristen Wiley, were kind enough to spend some time with me and kind of walk me around the premises, take me through what they do every day, uh, and basically to kind of show what it takes both personally and professionally to make a, an operation like this run. It's one of the largest operations of its kind in the entire world, so uh, no small feat to be sure. And they took a, both of them took several hours out of their day, which is almost every day is busy, seven days a week, when you got over 2,000 animals, uh, you know, to take care of, and a business to run, and um, and they were just incredibly courteous, kind, and very uh, uh, forthcoming with information, and um, basically telling experiences both past and present. So I find this kind of work fascinating. Uh, this also helps flesh out my. Um, series called The Legends of Venom, where I talk to venom extractors uh, across our great nation. And I have some more lined up coming down the pipe. But, uh, you know, once again, I'm talking to all the big players. And uh, so far, all the big players have been incredibly kind and uh, very giving of their time. So kudos to them uh, for helping put this together. So due to the length of uh, the shoot, uh, I'm going to cut this down into smaller segments and try to keep the videos probably to about 15 minutes a piece, but there'll be many different parts and I'll make sure to link them so they play back to back to back. Um, so I hope you enjoy. Uh, there's going to be footage uh, interspersed of interviews uh, with both Jim and Kristen and uh, there's going to be some extraction video uh, of them extracting from spitting cobras and Indian cobras, which was also fascinating. Uh, we're going to see uh, a clutch of eggs uh, from a cobra, and we're going to see a little bit about the facility, one of the more interesting rooms that they have there with exotic species. And, uh, and once again, I think the most interesting part for everybody, hopefully, is actually getting to know uh, uh, Jim and Kristen. Uh, they have some, a fascinating outlook on things, and they're just a wealth of knowledge. And for those of you who are in the area or haven't desired to go, please go visit the Kentucky Reptile Zoo. I'll put information in the links below. Uh, they also have a YouTube channel, so don't forget to subscribe to that. Um, but, you know, if you're ever in the area of Kentucky or around my neck of the woods, it's about two and a half hours from where I live, uh, you know, take time out of your day to go see them. Um, support them. You know, this is a nonprofit. Um, basically, they are procuring a substance from, in a, in a very dangerous way, uh, that helps save lives all across the world. So this is a this is a great charity. Uh, well, not really a charity, but it's, you know, it's a great place to to give money to, in light of more standardized charities where the money could just be going anywhere, including the paying CEOs. Uh, Jim himself doesn't even take a salary. So, <laughs> so definitely uh, definitely uh, worthy of your support and patronage. Make sure to like I said, go out there and um, not only would you be supporting you know the zoo itself but I mean it's it's very informative and a very interesting tour you get to see all kinds of great species I saw several species that I've never seen before in captivity so and I've seen a lot of snakes in captivity so very fascinating so anyway I hope you enjoy I'm gonna go ahead and stop right now with this uh, <laughs> rambling diatribe to get things started but uh, don't forget to like and subscribe uh, if you enjoy this content let me know I'll have more of it coming up in the future uh, please feel free to comment below uh, let me know what you think about the video series um, and once again, I do suggest that you go check out their site and you know, give them any kind of support that you can. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into some interviews. Until next time, this is Genome, out. All right, so I'm sitting down with Jim Harrison here, the uh, Assistant Director of the Kentucky Reptile Zoo, and we're going to have a little Q&A session real you know, fast so you can get to know the man a little better. and. Uh, you know, learn about the person who literally takes his life into his hands every day for the betterment of mankind. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? <laughs> so, uh, you know, tell us a little sounds, about It sounds better than getting crapped on every day. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's <laughs> the, uh, you might see some of that in the footage, too. It's the one of the unsung tasks. You know, everyone sees the fun part because they don't see what's below that mirror down there or that window. So, mm -hmm. so Jim, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I, I, like most people who are interested in snakes, I caught my first snake when I was like six years old. I noticed that everybody, all the adults were like flabbergasted by the snake. In fact, everybody thought it was a copperhead or a cottonmouth and it was just a water snake. 
And so I started reading about snakes, and my dad got me some books about snakes, and by the time I was 12, I was reading on a college level in herpetology. And when I was 15, 16 years old, I met a gentleman named Dr. Sherman Minton, who is probably one of the best herpetologists and toxinologists that ever lived. He, he was great because he had no ego, but he was willing to put you in your place when you were screwing up. And yeah, this I, is not a job. I think you could, you could you can't sit there and be nice to somebody. When no, he he was very he was very he was very diplomatic, mm -hmm. and um, he got kind of guided me and got my interest peaked a little more. Then Mike Good at the Columbus Zoo and uh, Dan Badgley, um, all those guys up there kind of helped me out over the time. And then by the time I was about eighteen, I was already starting to extract venom. Um, I've been extracting venom for about forty three years now. I average about anywhere from 600 to 1,000 extractions a week when everything's going smoothly. And, you know, every once in a while I have an accident. Um, nobody's perfect. Everybody's more fixated on the accidents than they are on anything else. You know, they always want to see the fireworks. They don't yep. want to see you putting together the, uh, the gunpowder. Uh, well, you know? I, tell, I tell people <laughs> if it looks exciting, it means I screwed up. So I'd rather be nice and smooth and calm. So it's like, you know, I tell people, it's like having an opponent, fresh opponent in front of you every couple seconds. They're not tired, you are. So you have to stay focused. Now I've talked to some other extractors and most say they'll, they'll work for about an hour and then they'll take a break. Is you do something, the kind yeah. of volume you do, I don't think you can yeah, do that. I, do. I, you know, I, when, I, when I'm flowing, I do, in two hours, I'll do it between 200 to 300 snakes. So I, I have usually, I don't set a, time period. What I do is I set my mind that this isn't a race and when I get tired I stop. So if it's 15 minutes and I'm tired I stop. If it's three hours and I'm not tired I don't stop. So have you ever like walked in the door one morning fresh new day and said you know what I'm not gonna extract today. Yeah. I don't feel it. it yeah. Maybe yeah. you're not even sick maybe just something feels off yep. and yeah I've 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 done that. I don't try to second guess myself. I, mean, I, I, I operate from a mindset of um, very bushito and, and that I also operate from the mindset of I have an empty mind when anything's presented in front of me. I don't perceive that I know, you know, like in fixed, you know, kind of like in the martial arts mm -hmm. when people go through fixed forms and you, you dun, dun, dun. I don't know what that snake's going to do. I don't assume anything. I don't underestimate my opponent. I don't assume that the snake's gonna go left because he might go right. And if I go the wrong direction, he bites me. So I have to be, what's presented in front of me is what I have to react to. So I react to them. I don't have them react to me. Yeah, I know. Um You'll hear a lot of misconceptions out there. People will be like, well, puff adders, or excuse me, not puff adders, they like a boom vipers. Mm -hmm. Placid, easy to work with. I know they're strong, but never had a bad day temperament. And the Echis or Sawscale Viper is horrid to work with because they're always snapping. And it may be completely reversed one day, so you can't just go in there expecting well, here, exactly what... Well, here's something Kristen came up with, and when you talk to her, she might explain it a little bit better than I do. We call it the one percentile. When you have one snake, you may never see this behavior that we see when we have thousands of them. That one percentile will put you six feet under if you don't pay attention. That kind of leads me to my next question. Um, you know, how long has the Kentucky Reptile Zoo been in operation and uh, how many specimens do you have here? Um, Kentucky Reptile Zoo opened in 1990. I moved down here in 1989 and started working on setting it up. We've originally, it was a small uh, exhibit up on the main road and then I bought the property down here. Um, we just, I was told when I moved down here the, the business would fail in one year. I just paid off the bank yesterday. So I own, I own nothing on this property right now. Um, but, you know, we've kind of, it's been, you know, I slept on the floor for many a year. Mm -hmm. I, I ate potatoes instead of eating <laughs> steak. I did whatever I needed to do. I sacrificed everything that I could to be able to do what I'm doing. So the zoo itself, what, we, what we're trying to do is we're trying to be, show that the snakes can be extracted from and they can be done in a, the most humane method as possible. The snakes can live for many years. They can reproduce in captivity. And in the old days, the old mentality was 
live six months, a year, fine. And I didn't like that idea. So I have snakes here that are over 40 years old that have been on the venom line the whole time. I have king cobras here that are 35 years old that still breed when, you know, a lot of the zoos in the United States right now have our offspring on display. So we've, I've been breeding king cobras since I was 18 years old, off and on. Did so you that, have, that was the first snake I extracted from venom from was a king cobra. That seems to be a popular one. Yeah, <laughs> you think well, more, it, it, think it starts off a little then, easier or something. You know, it, actually, it is the easiest. Is it? That's, that's why everybody has them. I mean, they, they're, once they're acclimated, they're easy to take care of. They're big, which makes them sometimes hard to handle. Mm -hmm. But in the same extent, they're pretty laid back and they're pretty intelligent. So they're actually dangerous for a different reason than what people think they're dangerous from. They're dangerous because people think they're toys. Mm -hmm. I have a ma major problem with the fact that people think snakes are toys or they're accessories. They're neither. They're animals, and you need to treat them with respect. I have seen myriad videos and pictures of people freehandling uh, kings yeah, uh, with free just a big pair of rubber gloves on and, or something. Yep. And I, I've seen them freehandle, and I've also done autopsies on people that are freehandled. So, you know, it, it, uh, reviewed autopsies. Um, you know, you play fire, you get burnt. You know, my big problem with it is that a lot of that stuff is also used against us by the Humane Society. So it's, it gives, a, it paints the picture. Everybody paints us with the same brush, and that is that everybody who has snakes is crazy. You know, so we, we show a picture of somebody being reckless. And, you know, I, I train law enforcement. I train, um, you know, first responders and everything else. and. There'll be other people sometimes at the training things that put pictures up of people free and stuff. And if you just hear them in the audience go, oh, look at that idiot. Look at that idiot. Is that how, is that how all snake people are? <laughs> and I'm like, no, that's a, that's a small percentage of the egomaniacs that just want attention. But it gives everyone else a bad name. Right. I mean, yeah. I, literally, I would fire anybody who works for me if they penned a snake. You don't pose with snakes. No. They're not toys. The only reason we extract from them is because we have a reason to. It's stressful for the animal. Um, we try to lessen the stress as much as possible. Um, as Kristen explained to you earlier, the snakes will eat voluntarily. I mean, those cobras will be fed tomorrow and they'll eat. You know, they, they're used to it. Hmm. That kind of leads me to another question. Did you have any problems getting permits or setting up zoo because of the kind of animals you keep here? Um, initially, there were no laws in the state of Kentucky. Kentucky kind of came in, and people think it was because of snakes, but it was actually because of uh, a gentleman who had a uh, cigarette shop, and uh, the person who owned a cigarette shop was a cousin of some representative of Kentucky <laughs> and, and stuff, and the guy used a capuchin monkey to come out and give cigarettes to the mm -hmm. person. And actually, I messed that up, really. The guy who got the cigarettes was, the, the, was a relative of the congressman. And the capuchin monkey ran out and decided to take a piece of the guy with him back into the cigarette <coughs> store. And it was, happened to be part of his ear. And from there came the, why do people have these as pets? Why do people have this? And Kentucky came in and said, we're going to ban everything, and basically that's what they did. And we were exempted because we're a research facility. Mm -hmm. Anybody who wants to sit up in the state of Kentucky could go to the Fish and Wildlife and go through what they want to be exempted, you know, and become exempted if they want to. But it's not easy. We have to maintain anti-serum. We have to have, you know, follow. I, we don't follow rules. We don't expect other people to follow, you know. Yep, lead by example, right? Yep. And yep. that leads me into another thing that some people will ask, uh, being a professional, what is your opinion on private keepers, people who keep things in their own home, neighborhoods, apartments? I, I'm not professional. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm somebody who's done this a long time. I'm the, I, don't, I don't consider myself an expert. And I don't consider myself a professional. I consider myself somebody who does this. This is what I do. Um, as far as people keeping snakes, I don't have a problem with people keeping snakes. I, in fact, I would have kept snakes when I was young. I mean, that's how you keep, you keep people's interests. As far as venomous snakes, 
I don't think you should think that it's somebody else's responsibility to provide you with anti-serum. My anti-serum here is for my employees. I didn't go through all the trouble of bringing it in so that somebody could play with a cobra up in Michigan. Mm -hmm. Somebody else could, you know, benefit from my anti-serum. If you want to set up an anti-venom bank, you have to do it in your own state because there's, it's not, it's not realistic to think that you're going to get the anti-serum in an appropriate amount of time flying it from another state to another state. You're wasting time. You know, I've had the license, the, the federal, in, investigal, yeah, federal investigational drug license since I was 18 years old. Dr. Sherman Melton helped me get it. In fact, it's such a low number, it's four digits, that a lot of times <laughs> the people when we're importing them through a new importation site thinks it's, it's a fake number. The bakery left some numbers yep, off. <laughs> yep, <laughs> yep, so it's, it's actually held up anti-serum a couple times. But as far as people keeping venomous stuff, I mean, they're not, you know, if you're responsible, we're not, it's not rocket science. You know, the, the, the responsibility is the issue of making sure it's securely kept, um, that you have at readily access to anti-serum. And that doesn't mean your local zoo. I've had people come through here when it was still legal, and they would look in the cage and go, okay. And basically they now. were making a list of what I had so they knew that I had the anti-serum for it. Yeah, I know probably 20, 25 years ago, I was hunting in the woods. I was out looking for coral snakes. I wanted, it, I had it in my mind, I wanted to keep a coral snake. And mm -hmm. the internet was a lot uh, less friendly than it is now. Yeah. It wasn't much information, but I stumbled across a guy. He lived in Tampa. He just kept them in his house. And he basically had a 12 page diatribe on why you think you want a venomous snake, and then here's why you really don't want one. And he says, you know, I have no problem people keeping them. I have them in my house, but you have to, like, turn your house into a fortress. You have to have, what, nine to ten vials of antivenom, depending kind of snake you have there. And you need to have $20,000 in the bank for emergency. <laughs> he just went through this whole spiel of how much work it actually is to keep one little snake. And it kind of changed my mind on the subject. Yeah. I was like, you know, I live in an apartment. Maybe this isn't the best idea. Well, yeah, it, it, you've got to think of why do you want it. Do you want it because of your ego or do you want it because you like the, you're mm -hmm. interested in the snake? If you're doing it because you want to make YouTube videos and handle a venomous snake while you're handling it, you know, to get attention, then you have it for the wrong reason. But that's, you know, a lot of things in life are that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, Kristen's a little more... Uh, stricter than I am <laughs> and I think that's mainly because you know she is it, there's been points where um, a certain zoo got somebody got bit and they had used their anti serum up on a private individual mm -hmm. and that zoo had to get rid of all their venomous snakes because one of their keepers got bit we had to ship anti serum to the zoo which I didn't have a problem doing. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not gonna let anybody die. I don't care, private, any, nobody. I'm not gonna let somebody die. But at the same extent, you put me at risk and you put my employees at risk. Kristen will and has talked people through, private individuals, how to get their anti serum. Now, when it comes to exotics, some of the anti serum is expensive. Australia is kind of expensive. But when you start talking the stuff that most people are keeping, it's not that expensive. You buy cages that are more expensive. Yeah. You know, the anti serum for um, monocle cobras, which are one of the most commonly kept cobras, or even kings, is a monovalent is 40 bucks a vial. That's it. And so you, then, get, you get about, what, 20 vials of that or so? You get, tw you know, 10 to 15 mm -hmm. is for a Kuthia, 20 to maybe 30 because a king has a large volume. Mm -hmm. Um, but typically, most bites, 10 to 15, will do it. And, you know, if you're willing to have at least 10, you're making an attempt, you know, in our eyes. And, and mm -hmm. that, that makes us feel a little more giving about it. But, I mean, I've been burnt. I mean, I've lost hundreds of thousands of dollars of anti-serum. You know, not recently because Kristen's gotten really good at <laughs> collecting, but um, over the years I've lost it because people have gotten bitten, and they didn't have insurance. They didn't, you know, they didn't care as long as they got saved, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and that was it. So it's a shame for that. So 
who was your mentor? Who got you started in the extraction business? Who showed well, you the ropes as far, originally? as far as the extraction, the interest in the venoms, that would have been Dr. Sherman Menton. And um, as far as, you know, husbandry and stuff, um, Mike Good from the Columbus Zoo and, and Dan Badgley from the Columbus Zoo had a big influence on me. So there's a lot of people who have had an influence on me. Everybody, I, everybody I meet, you know, from Jack to, to uh, George to Carl, you know, we all, I, I absorb something from it, mm -hmm. every one of them as far as information and stuff, and it, it helps form me. So, you know, I, as much as I, I, I loved Sherman and, you know, he's been gone for a while and he, how much he did for me and stuff, he was a human being and something that I don't like kids getting the idea of is that these people are anything above that mm -hmm. because they started looking at them as like heroes and you look at people a little unrealistically and then when a little bit of the curtain gets pulled back and they find out they have frailties then it, it's a big crash for everybody but in actuality everybody has frailties everybody's a human mm -hmm. So you don't want to look up to somebody as, there's a difference between a mentor and learning from somebody and somebody you worship. Yeah. So uh, I was, my, you know, my martial arts instructor called me the smiling Ronin. <laughs> the wandering samurai and the... Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, you know what a Ronin is. Yep. Yeah, there's no, you know, I worship mm -hmm. no, no person, no gods. I don't worship anything. Mm -hmm. I, all I w believe in is what is right and what is wrong. All right, that's a good that's a good uh, way of thinking, especially in this kind of business, because yeah. there's gonna be a right way well, of doing what you're doing, you know, and there's gonna be a wrong way. Obviously, every right? morning I wake up, I'm yeah. already prepared to be dead. Mm -hmm. I've you know been dead, so I, I know that there's always that. For not everybody gets to live, though. You know, everybody's gonna die, but not everybody gets to live. Yeah, you mentioned uh, putting people on pedestals and kind of mythic, mm -hmm. making mythic characters, and uh, like Bill Haas, people put him mm -hmm. at, at the top of the, you know, he used to be all, but he was almost dead more than once, and yeah. he had to share mishaps too, and yeah. so everyone's Bill, human. Bill was an interesting person. Yeah, he was a fascinating character. Fascinating <laughs> character, and car you know, it, it, just like everybody else, he, he had frailties and stuff, and you know, people ask me, well, did he live to be 100 because he injected venom? Mm -hmm. I'm like, he lived to be 100 because he was also vegetarian. Vegetarian. He was active every day. He was, you know, he had good genetics, mm -hmm. and he was never in a car accident that was fatal. Now, a lot of people don't catch that, but mm -hmm. what that is is there's a lot of people that may have lived to be 100, but they died in an accident because that's what happens. Physiologically, you don't know, you know, this is one person who did something. It doesn't mean he's got, that's mm -hmm. why he did it, you know. So he, he, he was very active. That's why he lived as long as he did. I, I think, you know, that's, I think people who have genetics that are bad will never make it no matter what they do. But if you have good genetics, you'll live, you can live to be in the hundreds. All right, so getting back to kind of the business side of things, is venom extraction, extraction something a person can make a living doing? Person There's could, two parts to this question, then, but I'll get the second part later. Yeah. The, as far as making money from extracting venom, it's a very small part of where we get our money. Most of our money comes from lectures and through tourism. That's basically the second part. I was going to ask if there's any facility of this type that can really sustain itself without the, the tourist aspect of it. Not, not really, not in have the amount of animals we have. We have close to 2,000 animals here at any given time. So that to do that and maintain and then pay workers comp, um, you know, have liability insurance and everything else, we have to have other funds coming in. So, um, you know, even though that's a major part of what we want to do is educate people, mm -hmm. it also is a part of what keeps us floating. And the other thing is I don't take a salary. I, I live off a small pension from the police department. I get 20% of my pension and uh, that's what I live off of. So, and that's what I've lived off of for, thir the zoo's been here, this is the 29th year for the zoo, so. That's incredible. Now, I remember watching this in another video, uh, how much do you spend on mice every year? I have no clue, that, yeah, that's a question for Krista, man. <laughs> okay. I, I, she has everything down to a, like, a, she has everything down. She knows how many, how much I spend on vitamins, <laughs> you know, I, I'm not a, uh, 
a clothing addict, obviously. I'm not a clothes addict. I'm, I'm not a uh, person who has like the sporty car or any of that kind of stuff. So most of our money goes back to just kind of like into the zoo or, you know, little things for mm -hmm. us. And, and uh, um, that's basically it. I mean, the, you know, it's not, a, it's got to be something. It, I get a lot of kids and like, Every time something shows up on TV or we show up on TV or we get somebody with an email saying, oh, yeah, you know, I want to I can milk this snake. I can do this, you know, and and there's more to it, man. There's just not it's not just I could teach a chimpanzee to do the physical parts of what I do, but to do the mental parts of it, mm -hmm. I can't teach. And so that's something people have to you know, know that they you have to fractionate the venom sometimes. You have to look, uh, have to have a lyophilizing machine, which most lyophilizing machines run from $25,000 up. Um, you have to have a freezer that's minus 40 <laughs> minimum. You have to have all this stuff that's really expensive to get just started. And then you have to be able to prove yourself. You have to be able to show that you know the species, and now it's getting down to the point where that you have to know locale of the species. Mm -hmm. So yep. all, it's getting more complicated. You have to keep a lot of records. Um, the ship venom overseas, if it's a CITES animal, you have to prove CITES. When Kristen does our CITES permits, which she has to do every year, she, for just for monocle cobras, to give you an example, there's 47 pages she has to go through. But that goes all the way back to my founder stock that I started breeding in the 70s. So I have bloodlines that go all the way back to the 70s, and then I have bloodlines that go back to the, the, the 80s from the Columbus Zoo that they gave me. So I have all these bloodlines, and I have to keep track of them all the way through. And that's just to be able to ship venom overseas. If I ship that venom overseas without those papers, I'm in violation of the Lacey Act, which is a felony. So if you milk your pet cobra and you send it to a friend overseas, you just did a felony.